everybody. Welcome back to Jammin' with Gammon, episode four. Today, me and my cool hat are going to look at how to practice. Now, um, today will be kind of an overview. We'll look at some general tips. And as things go along, if we need to have more online lessons, we'll start looking at very specific things you can do to practice. But just in general, the goal is to make your practice sessions productive. Sometimes they can even be fun. Now, sometimes they'll be frustrating. That's normal with anything that's difficult. But um, to make it as productive as possible so that you don't feel like you're wasting your time, here are a few ideas that will hopefully make things go smoothly for you. One of them is that it's a good idea to schedule a practice time and try to hold yourself to it. I have to do this with both my practice time and my workout time because otherwise I am likely to figure out any number of other things to do that might be more entertaining. If that's hard for you or you really have a hard time making yourself practice, maybe you can think of some kind of small reward you can give yourself for every day you successfully complete a practice session. It might be an episode of your favorite show. I have a bag of Skittles here at my desk so that maybe I can reward myself when this is done. So, and anything you can think of as long as it's good for you and safe. So. In terms of speaking of good for you, it's better to practice in a lot of short sessions rather than do one big, huge practice session for the week. Let's say I want to practice this week for two hours. I could do it all in two hours, or I could do two one-hour practices, or I could do four 15-minute, 30-minute, excuse me, practices, or I could do eight 15-minute practices. The most practical of those sort of depends on my schedule. But if I were to take my two hours and split it up into four 30-minute sessions on different days, that's when I'm most likely to be productive. It gives my muscles time to kind of learn and the things that I've trained them to do, gives my brain time to make those connections. And you can find it can be much more productive. It's way easier to get frustrated and tired if you're trying to go for long periods of time. That being said, if you decide that you're ambitious or you really are into practicing and you want to put in more than an hour or so, I strongly recommend you take a break at least 10 minutes every hour. Walk away from the practice room, put down your instrument, go get a drink of water or um, do something else, pet your dog. For just a few minutes, it's a good idea to kind of reset your body every 50 minutes or so. So again, just take that as advice to prevent injury and mental frustration. I know this is easier said than done for a lot of us, especially while everybody seems to be home right now. But if you can set yourself up in a place that's quiet with relatively few distractions, it's going to result in better practicing for you. And yes, that does include your phone. I put my phone in do not disturb mode. You can see right there, I'm in do not disturb because I want my entire focus, in this case, to be the class I'm teaching you and eventually my, the practice session I'm going to have. I promise you that your friends can wait the 15 minutes until you're done practicing, and it really does help keep your mind on one thing at once. Also, in general, it's a good idea to have a goal in mind for each practice session. So it might be today I just need to learn the notes and rhythms in this section, or you might want to look at a place that you have trouble playing in tune, or you might just decide I've really got to figure out how to play this rhythm. So you can focus on one thing. If you choose to do more, great, but at least you have a goal. And then when you've met that goal, you can say, I have met the goal and you can leave your practice session feeling like you've accomplished something. A few more things to think about, uh, and these are common mistakes everyone makes them. I know I made them when I was younger, and I still have to keep myself from making some of them to this day. Don't always start at the beginning. Uh, a lot of young students do that, and they're like, oh, I can play at the beginning. What happens then is you get very, very good at the beginnings of everything. Uh, Anyone who's been in an orchestra rehearsal for any period of time knows there's always that one person, at least, who plays all the beginning of the fanciest thing they know. I remember when I was growing up, we used to call them concerto heroes because they would know the beginnings to all the concertos, the, the first four measures of Tchaikovsky and first eight measures of Mendelssohn. And they were all very fancy, but we never heard them play anything past those first couple of measures. Pieces are long. Um, and it's good to be good at all of the sections. So, you know, 
do definitely spend time on the beginning when it merits that, but then you need to move on and be disciplined and say, okay, even though I sound good in that one part and it's very tempting to just play there and work into the new thing, sometimes just like in rehearsal, you've got to jump into the nasty part and go right at it. Um, and make sure on that token, you're going for the things that are hard for you. It's rewarding in a way to practice things that you already sound good on because, hey, I sound good and you can feel good about yourself. But at the end of the day, you're still not going to be able to play those harder sections unless you just tackle them and work on them. Um, as much as we all like to avoid things, think of how accomplished you'll feel once you get it. Another um, thing that I want you to think about as you're practicing, be aware of your body. Uh, Practicing and playing a string instrument can take a lot of toll on your muscles and tendons and ligaments. So you've got to make sure that you're paying attention. Do I hurt? Am I tight? Do I feel sore? Um, do I just feel really tense? If you any of those things, your body is trying to tell you, hey, back up a minute. So you might just want to step away, do a few stretches. If you're in pain, you may need to stop for the day to make sure that it's not that you're not doing any permanent damage to yourself. These things can happen. A um, few stretches, stay loose, maybe stop and get a drink of water. Just do something to give your body a break. And if you continue to have discomfort with something, maybe send me a picture or a video and I can see if there's something that you're doing that's maybe contributing to the discomfort. Maybe something in your bow hold or something with your posture that I can help with and then you can be more comfortable as you practice. But don't let something get so bad that you either stop practicing altogether or you can't practice altogether. Speaking of that, you need to be patient with yourself. Um, playing an instrument is hard. That's why everyone doesn't do it. String instruments have a reputation for being really hard, and they certainly have their challenges, but I don't think they're any harder intrinsically than any other instrument. But nevertheless, you're going to make mistakes. Sometimes you're going to sound bad. Um, it's just, that's, that's life. It's actually a good thing because it means you're challenging yourself and trying to push yourself a little further. Now, part of my job is to help you decide what is an appropriate level of challenge for you. But you can also trust your own judgment. If something seems way, way, way over your head, then maybe go with something a little bit easier. Or you can always ask for help. I'm always happy to give you suggestions uh, on pieces to try. Or maybe that one is a little bit too hard for you right now. Or no, I think you're going to be fine. Here's how you might approach it. Um, so it's okay if you can't play it right at once. That's the whole point. Um, if you get really frustrated, though, while you're working because nothing is going right or you're still making the same mistake every few minutes, uh, then step away. It doesn't do you any good to, to rage practice or rage quit while you're practicing. Sometimes it feels like you're just getting worse the more you do it. Um, and occasionally I have found, and this is just anecdotally my experience, but I've talked to other people who have noticed this too. Sometimes I get really terrible right before I'm about to make some kind of breakthrough, right before I get way better at something or I develop a technique that I really struggled with before. A lot of times I, I had worked on it so hard, but it wasn't working, getting frustrated. So finally, I just said, fine, I'm going to go do something else, maybe practice a different section, maybe give it a break for the day. And giving yourself time can sometimes finish creating all those little connections in your brain and in your muscles that can help you um, cross the hurdle and get over that obstacle. I also read an interesting study recently by a neuroscientist who specializes in sleep that going to sleep actually does seem to improve the results of practice sessions. So your brain, which is recovering, of course, while you're sleeping, is also processing all the things you did in the course of the day, including any practicing you do, kind of solidifying those connections and making them stick. So, you know, if all else fails, sleep on it. And um, last but certainly not least, if you miss something when you're practicing, mark it in. There is no shame. And I've said that I don't know how many times in orchestra. I keep at least one pencil on my music stand at any given time, usually two or three because people are always stealing my pencils um, or I break them or I just can't find one when I need it. But mark anything in that you feel that you need. My teachers would also mark in my music pretty 
pretty readily. I had one teacher who used a different colored pencil every day so that every lesson I could see what mistakes did I make that were the same from one week to the next because I definitely needed to work on those or what was a new thing that happened. Um, so, oh, last week there's no red mark, so I was okay in that measure, uh, but there's a brown mark uh, for this week, so I guess something went wrong. But anything you mark is going to save you time later because you're less likely to make that mistake again. Now, you can still do it. Sometimes I stare directly at a marking I've made and do exactly the wrong thing anyway. It happens, but at least give yourself every opportunity to do it right and mark it. So I know a lot of you have heard me say this before, but the, the eternal question, does practice make perfect? It does not. Practice makes permanent, uh, which is to say, uh, this is one of the most common things I see um, students do, and I'm guilty of it myself. We play something and we're, we're struggling with the section. It's, oh, da, 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 da. oh, gosh, I played it wrong. Oh, da, da. oh, I made the same mistake. God, I cannot get that E flat. Uh, uh, still no E flat. Oh my God, I played E flat. I did it. All right, moving on to the next thing. What I just did was practice the mistake a whole bunch of times, and I only practiced it correctly once. So what, what are my muscles going to do the next time I go there? They're going to do the mistake. That's the thing that they learned through repetition. So you need to be disciplined and give yourself so, you know, a lot of opportunities to repeat when you do well. Um, I have a friend who says once is luck, twice is skill. She's not wrong. Make sure that you're doing skill. Here's one way to do it. Let's say I have a difficult passage. I'm going to use my Skittles here as an example. And I'm really struggling with it. So I decide, okay, I'm going to work this part and then I play it right for the first time. All right, so I'm going to give myself one Skittle, one orange Skittle. Actually, that's ridiculous. You should never eat Skittles in singular. I always eat Skittles in pairs like most sane people do, right? Anyway, all right, two orange Skittles. That's for my first time playing it right. Oh boy, I played it right again. So now I'm going to get two red Skittles. Also, don't mix colors. Are you some kind of monster? All right, so now I have two orange Skittles and two red Skittles. I played it right twice. All right, I played it right again. Now it's green Skittles. Woohoo! I am I'm gonna have so many Skittles when I'm done with this, uh, and I'm ready for my purple Skittles. Uh, but I messed it up that time. So what I do is I take all of my Skittles, all, every last one of them that I earned, and I'm gonna put them back in the bag. Oh, goodbye Skittles. I'll miss you. The idea is, the goal for me is to play it at least five times in a row correctly. Now you might not want to do five. You might want to go for three. I don't really recommend less than three, but um, I was taught five, so that's what's in my head. So my goal is to get it five times correctly. And then when I've got my five times correctly, I can eat my 10 Skittles and everyone will be happy, except maybe, I guess, the Skittles. So um, in general, we can talk more about this specifically later, but some general techniques when you're practicing, think about how we might rehearse that if we were in orchestra. Mr. Rudolph and I use a lot of techniques that would work really well uh, in, as individuals, not just as groups. There's some things, of course, we can't do um, if there's just one of you, but a lot of the things we do are applicable. Um, working slowly and not getting faster until you're really ready to do that. Trying to play too fast too soon is a, is a great way to get yourself really frustrated. Um, you know, all of you know, if you've been around for any length of time, I love altering the rhythms. Like if I have a 16th note passage and I'm having difficulty with it, I'll I'll go through that section. I'll say, okay, first note long and then three notes are faster. And then I'll play it again. But this time the second note is the long note. And then again, the third note is the long note. And then the fourth note is the long note. And then I'll go back and play it as written um, with even 16th notes and 90% of the time, it's going to be much, much smoother once I've done with that. Sometimes it takes a few passes. you got to be picky with yourself, but I really do think rhythms can be an incredibly effective way to practice a hard thing for your left hand. Um, you could also try adding one note at a time in those kinds of tricky passages. If I have a whole bunch of really hard 16th notes, say, or a really fast passage of eighth notes, all right, first I'll play the first two. Okay, now I'm going to play the first two and add the third. All right, now the first three, then I'll add four, then five and six and so on. That can be a good way to build up a passage when you feel like you have no idea what's going on. Just take it one note at a time. 
Um, you can also isolate the problem that you're having, just like we might do in rehearsal. If there's one particular thing that you're having trouble with, don't practice like starting at measure five and going all the way to 10. If the problem is in measure eight, just go right to measure eight. Uh, very specifically, let's say I'm having trouble going um, between two notes with a string crossing. Maybe I just practice between those two notes. Or if there's a shift I'm having trouble, I'll just go in between the two notes for the shift until my hand learns that distance. Um, if it's a bowing problem, maybe I'll just try that bowing a few times in a row until I feel like I can't play it any other way. Um, and to go along with that, if things are really frustrating, you've got like it's hard, the bowing is hard, the notes are hard, I don't know what I'm doing, put down one of those things. So maybe if notes are hard, I'm going to put down my bow and I'm going to just concentrate. I'll play pizzicato through the passage and I'll make sure I learn all the notes in my left hand. Okay, and then separately, I'm going to figure out this bowing. So I'll play the bowing, but on open strings. So I don't have to worry about everything that's going on over in my left hand. So those are all tricks that you can use to help things um, go more smoothly for you. There are lots more. If you have techniques you like, please let me know about them in your exit ticket. I'd love to add them to our list of tricks. Um, and I also have quite a few more that I can share with you along the way. But for now, I'm going to do the scary thing. I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. I have picked out a piece that I have never played before. I've always wanted to play it, just never had the chance. Um, and I'm going to learn it right in front of you in real time. I'm not going to practice beforehand. Um, today, I'm just going to play it cold. So you can see how the practice process works and how it pays off in the long run. It's not going to sound good. Um, and it's kind of scary to put yourself out there when you know you're not ready. But I really think it's important for you to see that everybody sounds bad some of the time. I'm not saying I'm one of the world's great violinists because I am definitely not. But, you know, I, I played for 40 years. I can do some things. Um, but in, even so, this puts me in kind of a vulnerable position. Vulnerable position. So I'm trusting you to be kind and um, not to mean my horrifying mistakes. Just take this as it's intended, a way to show you that the process works if you work the process. It's probably going to be fine. All right, so I'm going to pause and set up for that, and I'll be right back. And we're back. Um, while I was paused, I went ahead and I tuned myself, and I did a few of the warm-ups I typically do before I practice. We can talk about those a different time, but I wanted to keep the focus in this brief practice session about the actual process so that you could see that. But don't skip warm-ups and don't skip tuning, for heaven's sake. So I'm set up, hopefully, for success here. Um, obviously, I have my music stand ready to go. The lighting in here isn't great, and I'm old, so I usually I like to use a stand light so that I can see what I'm doing. Um, your mileage may vary. So the, what is on my music stand? You know what is not on my music stand? is my phone. Phone's going over here. It is in Do Not Disturb because you and this instrument and that music are my priority right now. But I always keep on my music stand, as I said, at least one pencil. I also have any, I have my scale book that I've had since eighth grade, which don't do the math, but it's been a really long time. Um, I always play some scales when I warm up. And um, this book, the Eggplant Book of Doom, um, got me through a lot of things. And the, you'd be amazed how many ways you can play scales. I also keep an etude book right now. Um, I thought it would be useful. Etudes are little exercises that are usually designed to focus on something in your technique. So this book, the Kreutzer, very famous book. Um, I've had this one since like seventh or eighth grade as well. It has ways to deal with almost any technical challenge you can imagine. So I usually keep it in there because if I run into some trouble, I might go, okay, there's, there's an etude for that. Um, and Sometimes I have others too, uh, other etude books, but my first stop is usually the Kreutzer etudes. Um, I also, right now, I have a double stop book on my on my stand. This is an early-ish one, but sometimes it's good to warm up. I got it out of my files because the piece I'm learning is going to be focusing heavily on double stops, so I'm probably going to need some extra practice on that. I also have um, the pieces that I've been working on. I almost always try to keep a Bach piece on my on my um, stand at any given time. 
there, it's a long story. This one also very old version, I think. I also got this one in eighth grade um, and I played my way through the sonatas and partitas, but there's always something good in Bach. I have the piece I'm learning for electric instrument, um, which written by Dave Wallace, pretty excited to do this one. I'm not practicing that one for you just yet because I feel like the electric is its own kind of distraction. But once I have it worked up a little bit, I'd be happy to show it to you. And last but not least, the piece that I'm planning to learn um, during this period time off, the Beethoven Sonata in A major, That's it's called the Kreutzer Sonata. I've loved it forever. I remember falling in love with it when I was in like seventh or eighth grade. Um, and I bought it sometime before I got married. And based on the handwriting, I probably bought this in like high school or something. So I've been sitting around in my various music drawers for probably close to 30 years. Yikes. So... Today's the day. I'm going to start it. I have not worked on it before, so I'm going to not edit this video, and that's going to be hard because it's going. I'm going to make mistakes, and I'm going to find them embarrassing. But again, I want you to see that it's okay to make mistakes, and they just help you learn, and everybody makes them. So you can see there's um, nothing written in the part yet. It's a clean part. All I've done is look over it, and I've listened to a few recordings of my favorite violinists so I could get an idea of what's happening. So, um, enough stalling. I better just do it. Um, please be nice. Um, so, this piece starts out with a whole lot of double stops, triple stops, and quadruple stops, meaning I'm playing more than one note at the same time, for those of you who are um, younger and haven't run into that too much yet. And that is a weakness of mine. That's part of why I also picked this piece to work on because it addresses many of the things that I don't think of as my strengths. Double stops is definitely one of them. So that'll be a good challenge for me. Um, so, and I also mentioned that when you start practicing, you should have a goal and you want to work in kind of small, manageable chunks. So the beginning of this piece, the first, I don't know, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. First, um, like 20 measures or so are, are a slow part. Um, it gets faster after that. So I think I'm going to focus on just the first 20 measures or so, um, so or however many it is. The distance between the opening uh, and the presto. And I'll make that today's goal. If I get through it and I don't have any problems, maybe I can go a little bit further. But frankly, looking at this, there are going to be some problems. Now, I'm not going to make you watch my entire practice session. I'm likely to work for about an hour or so today, depending on um, how, how I feel and how my mood is. I'm not going to make you watch me work for an hour, but I'd like you to see me start the process. And I want you to hear my first time trying it. So here we go. This is probably fine. Um, the microphone, by the way, is not great, so um, please excuse the tone quality. I did try to turn the gain down so you're not getting quite as much interference. Um, when it sounds better, I will get a better microphone to use. All right, so I'm looking at it. First thing I notice, it is in 3-4. Always important to check your time signature. The key signature is A major, so that's three sharps, F sharp, C sharp, and G sharp for those of you playing at home, although it spends a lot of time in A minor later on, but that's neither here nor there. So I know all those things. So let's say I just decided, well, I'm just going to play. I'm going to see how far I get.
Okay, and that's the opening. Uh, so you could see I was probably making a great deal of faces. There's some tricky stuff in here, and it did not sound particularly good. Certainly not something I'd want to perform in front of people. Um, the very first chord is a challenge. So I've got four notes I have to deal with across all four strings. So I want to make sure my bottom notes are in tune. All right, so check that. And then... doing a lot of listening and adjusting. hand working on that and so the process I went through is first I tuned the bottom notes and then I really struggled with those um, middle notes getting the first finger E where I wanted it to be uh, and then went back and sort of tuned it from the top down using my octave A's to kind of get in tune there and then I built the chord backwards and once I was fairly pleased with the intonation I found a place where my hand is comfortable doing that and my elbow is comfortable because moving my elbow can change how it sounds. Uh, then I was able, then I did it a few times to get the feel of the chord. I still need to make some decisions like how am I going to break the chord? Am I going to go like lower notes? That does not seem like a good idea. I'm going to set it all and let go so I can vibrate. Do I want do I want to make it a faster break? Those are all musical decisions um, that I can make later on. The main thing right now is I just want to get the technical down. And the hardest thing is the intonation for me to get my fingers where they need to be when they need to be there. So good. Now I have a first note. Hooray. I'm going to go to the next chord. And they have a weird fingering, but... But I think it's a good one. I'm just not happy about it, but the suggested fingering, I'm for those of you who are curious, it's asking me to have my second finger in second position while my first finger is still back in first position, but that's because it's transitioning me. Yeah, yeah, that's going to work. Is it... So I need to make sure it's in my ear correctly. So when I'm trying it with the weirder fingering. That's going to take some work too. So and then I need to figure out how am I going to get from here. Uh, my monitor keeps going to sleep. My apologies. Oh no. Okay, you're still there. That's good. So anyway, got to get from here to this and that I missed entirely. All right, so I'm going to try it again. That was a little better. Starting to get there. Want to make sure I don't lose that first one I did. All right, that's not bad. Then I would go and find that chord. So process all over again. I'm from here. And that one I would also repeat. Now, um, this video is running a little bit long, so I'm going to stop recording at this point. I'm going to continue to work, but that's the process I'm probably going to use today. A lot of adjusting and checking, a lot of repeating. Um, so it's the first thing anyone who hears me perform this is going to do. So I really want to make sure that it's clear, and um, I'll probably be doing exercises to improve those double stops. I'll do some work with the tuner to make sure 
that my intervals are in tune. Um, so there's a lot to think about. And I just spent a good, um, yeah, probably six, seven minutes just on two or three notes. But I think it's time well spent. Um, certainly, I sounded better when I started. So I'm going to sign off for today. What I want you to do now is to think about a piece that you would like to play so you can practice practicing. So let's see. Oh no, it's infinite means. I really need to turn down my mouse sensitivity. So what I'd like you to do now is to pick a piece. It can be anything you want. It can be one of our orchestra pieces. It can be a solo thing that you've always wanted to try. It can be, say, church music, if that's your thing. Um, popular song, anything that interests you, that you think you would like to learn to play. If you don't have your instrument, then I suggest you find a song that you would like to play when you get your hands on your instrument again, and then kind of plan out how you are going to go about working. Or you could even try learning the fingerings on something else. No, never know. If you need ideas, you can email me or put something in the comments and I can get back to you. Um, I can recommend the Suzuki Method Book series. They have them for violin, viola, cello, and bass. They're available all over the place. Most music stores tend to carry them. And um, it, online, a lot of music stores will have them as well. I've seen them on Amazon. So if you want to ask mom or dad or grandma or grandpa, whoever's in charge of you, if they would like to invest some $7 in the Suzuki book. There's lots of great solos to play in there. I would say books one and two are good for our middle school players. Um, anything for, for more experienced players, you can look at um, even the end of book two, start of book three into four, depending on where you feel like your your starting point is. Um, three is a really good place to start with if you're not sure, because there's some good concertos even in book three. Um, I can't scan them for you. That is not legal. Sorry, I, I would love to help you, but I can't do that that way. Um, but again, you, you can look online. There's so much music online. Just please make sure you're careful uh, if you're going to download something online so that you don't infect your computer with viruses while we're all trying to avoid biological viruses. Um, yeah, and just, you know, so you don't expose all your information to uh, some guy sitting in a dark apartment in Russia or wherever it is that people who do music scams live. I don't know. Um, make yourself a plan. Try, try to have a practice session where you really think about what you're doing and why you're doing it. Don't just do it to make the minutes go by. And then last and not least, give me a little note in the exit ticket. What are you going to try to play? How did it go? Oh, no. <laughs> My watch has advice. All right. So that's it for today. I hope you learned something. And tomorrow we'll have the last Gammon with Gammon before spring break. Take care.